everybody's doing this morning because I've been listening. Y'all are all pretty excited to be here, and that's that's really exciting. Um, today we're talking about a a serious, serious message. So I'm glad you're fired up and glad to be here because this is going to speak to some people today. And um, we're going to talk about a series. As, as Dabney was sharing during worship, we're talking about depression today. And depression, we we think it in church circles. Depression, you know. It, Christians don't get depressed, and, and you know people that have things together don't get depressed, but that that's not true. Um, the world just recently took a took a hit when we lost Robin Williams, and some people say you know that Robin Williams killed himself, but I disagree with that statement. Um, if a person is ill, we wouldn't say that the people who have died from Ebola, we wouldn't say that they've killed themselves. We would say what that Ebola killed them. And I believe that depression killed Robin Williams. He didn't kill himself. Um, depression is a very serious thing. And, and what we're going to look at today is, is so many times we think, you know, if you just had enough faith, you wouldn't be depressed. But I'm going to show you in the life of Elijah, the prophet, this great, phenomenal man that we've been looking at the past three weeks. This guy who can raise people from the dead. This guy who can pray and fire comes from heaven. This guy who prays and the rain comes. This guy who had phenomenal faith. This guy who'd encountered God and relied upon his provision was fed by ravens. The ravens brought him his meat. They brought him his bread. He had a supply of water when there was no rain in the land. And yet he goes through a series of depression. So I'm praying today, and we're about to go to the Lord in a word of prayer. I'm praying that this message will speak to you today because I know that some of you are here and maybe you're at a place of hopelessness, a place of despair, sinking into depression, feeling like you're sinking into a hole and you don't know how to get out. I want to show you today how you can fall into depression, and I want to show you God's prescription to overcome depression. So before we dig into this thing, let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer. Father, we come before you right now, and we are so thankful to be able to come here today to freely come together and celebrate the fact that we do know Jesus. And Lord, for those that might not know you, I pray that today, that through this message, even as we're looking at being in despair, that you will speak to them and draw them near to you. Lord, I pray that for anyone that is hurting today, that your word, your truth will be spoken through my mouth. Nobody needs to hear from me. They need a word from you today, from the truth of your word. And I pray that you will speak through me and that you will reach them and lift them up out of the pit of the dis pit of despair they may be going through. Father, for those that might not be despairing, I pray that you will take this message and write it upon their hearts so that they can minister to those around them that are hurting because so many people are hurting and we oftentimes do not see it. Lord, open our eyes today. Open our hearts to receive your word. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, Elijah, you know, this guy, he, he came on the scene at a time where he, it was a corrupt generation. We've talked about that. He, he came on the scene when the evil king Ahab was ruling. The Bible says that Ahab had done more evil than all the kings before him. And that's when Elijah the prophet, the Tishbite, that's how we know him originally as Elijah the Tishbite. But by the end of the first day that we talked about him, 23 verses into knowing who Elijah was. We, he goes from being Elijah the Tishbite to Elijah the man of God. And, and he, he called out Ahab and he prayed that there would be no rain and, and there was no rain. And God just blessed him and took care of him and he strengthened him and he taught him faith and obedience during this time where the world is, is suffering. God was building up Elijah, preparing him for his showdown on Mount Carmel with the 450 prophets of Baal, the, the God Baal who, who could bring fire. And these 450 prophets are praying, bring the fire and Baal doesn't show up because a false God only promises what only the true God can deliver. And Elijah, he says, now it's my turn. And, and he prays and, and and God brings the fire, and he burns up the sacrifice that's on the altar. So Elijah, he's fired up right now. And the Bible tells us that he went and had with the sword, the 450 prophets of Baal were killed. And then Elijah says, now that they know the power of the Lord, he, he climbs up Mount Carmel, and he says, it's time to pray for the rain to return. And he prays. And y'all remember last week we talked about on the distance it looked really small, but Elijah knew it was going to get big. And he told Ahab, you better get the moving because the rain is coming. And that's where we're going to pick up today. We're going to see that Elijah at this place where, where after having this extreme spiritual high, 
he's about to sink into an emotional low. All right, he, he's told his servant, go tell Ahab, you better get on down the mountain because the rain is coming. You better go tell him to get ready because here it comes and it is coming big. So Ahab starts heading down the mountain. And Elijah, empowered by the Spirit of the Lord, runs off ahead of him. And he beats him down the mountain. And then when they get back down the mountain, that's where we're picking up. In 1 Kings chapter 19, Ahab gets down the mountain. And he goes to his evil wife, Jezebel. And he goes to Jezebel and he says, it said, the Bible says, Ahab told Jezebel everything that Elijah had done. How he had killed all the prophets with a sword. And so Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that of one of them. The Bible says Elijah was afraid. And he ran for his life. Elijah was afraid. And he ran for his life. You know, it's kind of confusing when you think of all that he's been through, all that God has just done for him, that he would be afraid and run for his life. I mean, this is the guy who's experienced miraculous provision, miraculous protection, miraculous favor, miraculous answers to prayers. But when, when this woman threatens him, it says he was afraid for his life and he ran really a smart guy. You know, if you think about it, a woman threatens him, he's got to get on down the road. I can remember growing up, you know, I'd be outside and man, me and my friends, we weren't scared of nothing. You know, I mean, we were, we were some little knucklehead heathens, you know, just doing all sorts of crazy things. And we'd run around, we'd play in the sewers. We thought we were ninja turtles and we'd be in the sewers. We didn't, we weren't scared of snake snails, puppy dog tails, none of that. Cause that's what we were made of little stinking boys. And we'd run around doing all sorts of things. You couldn't, you couldn't mess with us. We were tough. You know, we, we was tough, but like when I mess up and my mama and my mama would get on me and she would threaten me with an inch. I'm going to whip you. Let me tell you, I was afraid for my life and I would run. So I get, I get what Elijah's going through. Now, my mama, she, she had a better arm than Jezebel because she'd reach on out and grab me. And I, I knew it was time then. I understand what he's going through. When a woman threatens you, he's like, oop, I got to go. You know, he wasn't scared of the prophets, but this woman, he had to get on down the road. So, so here he goes. He runs for his life. Now we think, and what we say is, well, you know, if he was just a strong enough Christian, he wouldn't have been afraid. And if he was just a strong enough Christian, he wouldn't have ended up in this situation. In fact, if he was a strong enough Christian, he never would have ended up in depression. You know, he wouldn't have been afraid of these things if he only really knew the Lord. But how dare we presume that and say that when we've already saw the way that he knows the Lord, the way he prays in expectation. So I want to show you today what's happening in his life, some steps that happens in Elijah's life, easy ways for us to fall in depression, no matter where we stand today, no matter how close to God we think we are, that if we fall into these things, we can sink into despair the same as he did. The first one is if a woman threatens you, you get scared. You know, that's, that's the first thing. Um, no, seriously, I want, I want to look. It says that Elijah... He ran, okay, he ran for his life. And when he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there. Okay, he's ran for his life and he runs all the way down to Beersheba in Judah. Now remember, he was in the northern kingdom of Israel. Now he's run into the southern kingdom and Beersheba is down at the very, very, very bottom of the southern kingdom. So this dude is done went as far as he can possibly go. So he gets down here and he leaves his servant there while he himself went another day's journey into the desert. He's done went as far as he could go. He leaves his servant and then he goes another day out into the place where where there is nothing, that place of despair. You know, that desert represents a place where there's nothing. There's nothing. It's hopeless in a desert. There's no water. There's nothing. So he's gone as far as he can, and now he sinks even a day further into a place of despair. So he gets down here, and he comes to a broom tree, and he sits under it, and he prays. He prays that he might die. Elijah, the prophet that we saw that faced down the 450 prophets of Baal, prays that he might die. He says, I've had enough, Lord. I can't take any more, Lord. It's too hard, Lord. I've had enough. Lord, I've had enough. Take my life. I'm no 
better than my ancestors. And then he lay down under the tree and he fell asleep. The first thing that he does here, the first thing that we see, the first way to fall into depression, what Elijah does is he wears himself out. He wears himself out. And if you want to sink in depression, the first thing you do is you wear yourself out. Go ahead, wear yourself out and watch what happens. See, over the past few years, Elijah's been going through this massive spiritual battle. I mean, it's, it's, like, it's like pray, favor, pray, favor, battle, faith, pray, God answers, God shows up, go back in prayer, go to a battle, God answers, and he's, it's wearing him out. And some of you, you understand that because you've been in a place where you're on your face, you're praying, you're struggling, you're praying, you're seeing miracles, but it starts, it starts wearing you out. And Elijah, that's where he was at. He, he's, he's just prayed and prayed. And now after this spiritual battle, he now goes as far as he can away from the threat physically. So when he was already in a spiritual battle, now he's physically worn himself out physically worn himself out. And once you start wearing yourself out spiritually and physically, you end up in a bad, bad place. Some of you today, you're beginning to sink into despair. You're feeling depressed. Why? You're, you're wearing yourself out. Maybe you're, you're a mom. Maybe you're your mom and you're going to work every day and you're coming home from work after working all day long, and you gotta you gotta prepare a meal and put food on the table, and then oh my goodness, the laundry and the dishes, they just won't go away. They're just always there, and you can't stay on top of them. And the kids got homework, and oh my gosh, you're wearing yourself out. You're praying over your kids and you're in the spiritual battle for their souls that they'll rise up. But physically, you're also wearing yourself out trying to take care of them. Maybe you're, maybe you're young, you know, maybe you're young and you're in school. You're in school and like you're trying so hard. You want to be plugged in at the church and you want to be involved in these things at school and you're on the debate club and you're in the band and you want to play sports too. And you're starting to get depressed and you can't figure out why. It's, it's because you're wearing yourself out. And sometimes it's not just physically. Sometimes mentally we start wearing ourselves out. Dads, husbands, we got to provide. We got to protect. We got to do these things and I'm struggling and it's so hard on me and I'm working and I'm just not able to bring home enough bacon to feed everybody and it's wearing me out. That's, that's what happens. We get to that place where it just wears us out and we begin to sink into despair. The next thing you do, if you want to get depressed, that we see Elijah did, is shut people out. It says he left his servant and then he went another day. Another day down in the hole. Another day out into the desert. And that's, that's what we do. If you want to get depressed, not only do you wear yourself out, but you begin to shut people out. Oh, you wouldn't understand what I'm going through. I mean, you just don't understand right now. You don't understand what it's like to be a single mom. You don't understand what it's like to have all these kids. You don't understand what it's like to be, you know, on the youth leadership team at a church and trying to be on a leadership team in school. You just don't understand. So there's no point in me talking to you. I will deal with this alone because you just don't get it. And that's what Elijah did. He shut his servant out. He didn't, his servant had nothing that he could tell him. He shuts him out and he goes a little further out into the desert. And if you want to get depressed, wear yourself out, shut people out, and then focus on the negative. Focus on the negative. That's what Elijah did. He focused on the negative. What did he say? I'm no better than my ancestors. Nobody said he was. Nobody said that he was better than his ancestors. He's bringing that up. He's just, he's just talking about negative things. Instead of focusing on things that are positive, he begins focusing on things that are negative. In fact, yesterday I tweeted a tweet. That sounds so ridiculous. <laughs> I put on Twitter, <laughs> okay, uh, in 140 characters or less, I said, if you want to change the world, if you believe that God can change the world through you, whether you believe it, or whether you don't, you're right. 
See, if you believe that God can change the world through you, then you can. But if you believe that you cannot do it, then you can't. And if you focus on the negative, then you'll never believe that you can accomplish anything that God has called you to do. And this is where Elijah's at. He's focusing on the negative. And that's, that's where we do. We say, I'm never going to be good enough. I'm never going to get out of this hole. I'm never going to get financially back in a place where that I don't have to worry week to week. My marriage is never going to get better. My kids are never going to act right. That's the one. I, my kids ain't ever going to act right. I'm never going to get into a place that is better. My life is not going to mean anything. There's no way that I can obey all the commands of God. Have you read them all? Have you ever read Leviticus? There's no way that I can accomplish this Christian life successfully. There's just no way. I'm not good enough. I can't do it. I'm so, so terrible. And sinking deeper into that pit. Instead of trusting God, we begin sinking in that pit because we look at our own selves in a bad way, focusing on the negative, exaggerating, focusing on the negative. And the last thing is forgetting God. You, you wear yourself out. You shut people out. You focus on the negative, And then you forget about God. And you will find yourself just like Elijah, somewhere in a desert, ready to die. Elijah, this man of God, <laughs> he forgot about God. The guy who had the birds feeding him. The guy who had the brook bringing him water. The guy who prays for the fire and the fire comes and consumes the sacrifice on the altar. The guy who prays for the rain and that's what led Ahab to go and snitch on him for what he'd done because God keeps showing up in his life. All of a sudden, something bad happens and he just forgets how good God has been. That the God who was faithful during those times, he forgets that he'll be faithful with him now. Because Jezebel swore by gods that don't even matter. The, she swore by the gods that couldn't bring fire. She's swearing by gods that don't even matter, but Elijah is forgetting that his God is capable. And that's what we do. We forget God. So, so I want you to see, if you're here today, and this is speaking to you because you've been wearing yourself out. If you're here today be, and, and you're not just wearing yourself out, but you're shutting people out. If you're here today, you've been wearing yourself out, you've been shutting people out, you've been focusing on the negative things in your life and you know that you've been forgetting about how good the God who redeems you is. You've been forgetting Him. You're here and you need to be spoken to. My prayer today in Hebrew, the word angel means messenger. And we're about to see a messenger of God, an angel of the Lord, go and speak to Elijah. And my prayer today is that I will be like an angel of the Lord, a messenger to you delivering God's word, God's prescription on how to overcome this depression, how to defeat this depression, how to come back out of the desert. And, and I want you to see here, this angel, he doesn't, it's not through a sermon, and he doesn't rebuke him. He doesn't belittle Elijah. He's not going to make Elijah feel this big because he's depressed. He's not going to make the depressed even more depressed by making him feel small. Don't you know that God's got you? That's not what he's going to do. I, I want you to look at what he does. And the first thing that he does, the first thing he does is he says to eat and rest. Eat and rest. Verse 5 says, all at once an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. Get up and eat. Elijah, get up and eat. Get up and eat. And he looked around. Elijah looked around. And there by his head was a cake of bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. And he ate and he drank and he lay down again. I got to say, on behalf of myself and Joe and Miss Makoko, she likes to eat too. <laughs> on behalf of us that all of us that like to eat. I'm just so thankful that God is always providing food, you know? Like, that God just is providing food constantly, and that's kind of exciting. I mean, He's always giving something to eat. But look, eat and rest. Now, that doesn't mean, because oftentimes when you're depressed, you'll gorge and be lazy. That doesn't mean gorge and be lazy, okay? Listen, sometimes the most spiritual thing we can do, not be lazy, not sleep. I want to sleep away my problems. Sometimes it's resting in the Lord. Resting 
in the Lord. We need to rest in the Lord. Sometimes the absolute most spiritual thing that you can do is rest. Some of us, we need to, if we're beginning to feel worn out, we need to rest in the Lord. You know what I believe is the most violated, most violated command? Some of you are going to say lust. No, I believe honor my Sabbath. Rest. The Sabbath day is a day of rest. And if we're going to be honest in here, when was the last time you have taken a day of rest in the Lord? In fact, if you have rested in the Lord for an entire day in the past year, let me see your hand. Two of us. Three of us. Three, four of us. Yeah. That is a command. But you know what we do? Instead of honoring God's commands to rest, we do our own commands to fill out lists. But rest is a command and lists are not. And we run around trying to accomplish this and that instead of honoring God and resting. I promise you, God would be much more pleased if you would honor Him and rest in Him than worry about the dirty dishes or the dirty laundry. Maybe the grass is just a little too high. That's okay. God wants you to rest in Him. And we need it. If not, we will find ourselves in a place of despair and that's hard for me to think that this is not speaking to you today when only four are resting in the Lord in the past year. We've got to turn to Him and rest in Him. And then also to eat. To eat. What's that a picture of? Eating. Jesus is the bread of life. We rest in the Lord and we partake of Him. Man doesn't live off of bread alone, but off of the Word of God. So we rest in the Lord and He strengthens and sustains us. And if we'll turn to Him and rest in Him, He will begin strengthening in us, lifting us up. It says, the angel of the Lord came back a second time and He touched him and said, Get up and eat. Again, get up and eat. Get back into the Word of God. Eat the bread of life. Get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and he ate and he drank. And strengthened by that food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. This is really cool here. This is really cool. This takes some studying to figure this one out. I'm fixing to go deep on you, all right? Y'all ready? Okay. Horeb, the mountain of God, is Sinai. The mountain where God delivered the Ten Commandments to Moses. In other words, a holy place. A place that you can go and experience God. If you're a Christian, where can you go and experience God? Church. Fellowshipping with other believers. Man, I see a family here that when y'all get together and do crazy things like haunted houses, you are laughing and carrying on and having a good old time. I'm talking about celebrating and having fun. So God's prescription is eat, rest, and go to church. I'm not talking about the Sunday worship experience. I'm talking about fellowshipping with your church family and experience God's goodness through His body. That's God's prescription right there. Eat, rest, and go to church. Go to Horeb. That's, that's where Elijah goes. And look, when Elijah goes to the holy place, when he goes to the holy place, this is what God does. He replaces Elijah's lies with his truth. And that's what we have to do. We have to replace our lies with God's truth. And notice, notice how the lie here, when I read this, I want you to notice how the lie is slipped in amongst a bunch of truth. The lie is slipped in because that's what Satan does. Satan slips it on in. He just slips it in there. In the middle of a bunch of true things, he slides in a little lie. And we focus on the negative, right? We start listening to that lie. We've got to replace it with God's truth. Now look, it says Elijah went into a cave at Horeb, at the holy place. He goes into a cave and he spends the night. And the word of the Lord came to him and says, What are you doing here, Elijah? Now, now, we know God wasn't really asking because he wanted to know. It's not like all of a sudden he became the lead investigator, okay? He already knew. 
his point is, is making Elijah say it because sometimes there's some power in admitting what's going on in our life. And he's wanting Elijah to admit while he's there. And so Elijah replies, I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. That's true. That's true. He has been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The dude raised someone from the dead through prayer. The dude brought fire from heaven through prayer. The guy prayed for rain and it came. Yes, he has been very zealous for the Lord. That is true. And it says, the Israelites have rejected your covenant. True, they had. That's the whole point. Elijah went and prayed there'd be no rain because the Israelites were rejecting the covenant. Again, true. He's broken down their altars. That's, that's true. That, that had happened. And put your prophets to death with the sword. That is true. The Israelite prophets have been put to death with the sword. These are all true things. But then Elijah says, I am the only one left. And now they are trying to kill me. False. False. And that's what we tend to do. I'm the only one left. I'm the only one that's doing the work. I mean, without me, it just all fall apart, you know. I'm just that important. I'm the only one. And man, that puts a weight on you. We are not the only ones doing the work. In fact, if you think you're the only one doing the work, I'm going to tell you you're listening to a lie because I'm looking at a room full of people doing the work. And I have friends that are pastors of churches that are doing the work. If you think here today that you are the only one left, that is a lie from the pits of hell and it's going to bring you down and you need to trust God because there are others just like us doing the work. There are others just like us doing the work. If you read further into this, you'll see that uh, the Lord actually says there's 7,000. And here's the thing, Elijah's so crazy at this point, he's so caught up in the lie, he forgets that he hid 150 of the Lord's prophets himself. What? But he starts listening to that lie. And when we start listening to it, we just can't see the truth for anything. We'll forget the truth of the past. We'll forget so much when we start listening to that lie and we've got to replace that lie with God's truth today many of you are believing that lie you're believing a lie you're believing not only that you're the only one maybe you're believing today that your marriage just can't be fixed maybe you're believing today literally that your children will never know the Lord maybe you're believing that your parents will never know the Lord Maybe you've got a, a brother or a sister that's buck wild and you've been praying for them your entire life and it just doesn't seem to happen. And you're just believing that they will never come to know the Lord. Believing these lies. It's time to replace these lies with God's truth. We've got to take every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ. And if it won't get obedient to Christ, that's because it's a lie. And it's time to rebuke it and get it gone. Do you understand? It is time it is time to replace the lies with God's truth. So, are you believing? Are you believing the lies of the enemy? Or are you believing the truth of God's Word? Which one are you believing? The lies of the enemy or the truth of God's Word? Because Satan, since day one, has worked the same. I've told you and I've told you and I've told you. What did he say to Adam and Eve? Did God really say? Did God really say? He still works that way today. Are we going to believe his lies or are we going to believe the truth of God's word? Now, <laughs> if, we want, if we want to overcome our depression, if we want to overcome it, we got to rest and eat. We have to replace our lives with God's truth. And then we got to know that God speaks in a still, small voice. Now, remember, Elijah is the guy who has seen miraculous provision, fire, resurrection, rain. He's used to God showing up in big ways that would just blow our everlasting minds up. We'd be like, what? But Elijah, he's used to it. It's just another day's work for him, you know, to see God show up all big like that. He's used to God showing up big. But I want you to look at how God shows up this time when he's down low. It says, the Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Didn't this happen to Moses at one point? Didn't, didn't Moses catch a glimpse? Didn't Moses catch a glimpse 
of God as he stood out and God passed by. And now Elijah in this holy place is the same thing's going to happen to him except for instead of catching a glimpse, he's going to hear a whisper. He's going to hear a whisper because you know what? God doesn't always work the same every single time. He doesn't always do the same thing every single time because he's mysterious. He's mysterious, okay? And so he goes out there and a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. It says, after the wind, there was an earthquake. You're thinking, man, this wind. And now an earthquake. God must be in the earthquake. Here He's about to appear in this earthquake. But the Bible says the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there came a fire. Elijah's like, okay, yeah, now God's got to be in the fire because, you know, I called down fire through prayer and, and God showed up in fire. So he's going to come in fire again this time. But the Lord was not in the fire. You mean no burning bush like Moses got? He's not in the fire? Where is he then? Where is God? And it says, after the fire came a gentle whisper. Oftentimes when we're at our lowest, God speaks softly. When we were at our lowest place, God speaks the softest. Sometimes it's not the booming, booming, booming act, but the gentle voice that God speaks in. As I was studying, I read a quote, quote by Warren Worsby. And I want to read this to you because this is absolutely phenomenal. Warren Worsby said the miracles on Mount Carmel were wonderful. The miracles on Mount Carmel were wonderful. But the lasting spiritual work in the nation, the children of Israel, God's people, the lasting spiritual work in God's people must be accomplished by the Word of God working quietly in the hearts of the people. So here's the thing. This is what I take comfort in. That's why I stand up here and preach every Sunday. And it's why I ask God to move me out of the way. Because here, here's the reality. I know my words cannot do anything in your life. I don't have that power. But I know that by my words and through my words, God can show up in a whisper if you will just open your hearts and your ears and listen. God can show up in my words and He can speak to you through my words. My words can't do it, but God through my words can speak to you if you will just listen. Just listen. Sometimes the most spiritual thing we can do is rest. Other times it's replacing our lives with God's truth. Other times it's just listening. Listening to what God is saying. And you know what? He's speaking to you right now. See it. He's speaking right now. The last thing God gives, does is He gives us something to do. He gives us something to do. Sometimes it's eat and rest. Sometimes it's replacing those lies. Sometimes it's just listen. But other times, He does give us divine assignments. He gives us something to do. The Bible says, The Lord said to him, Go back the way you came. Go back where you came from, Elijah. Go back where you came from. You're running from something. Go back the way you came. Go back, and when you get there, anoint Hazel, king over Aram. Also, anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, king of Israel. And anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, from Abel, Mahola, to succeed you as prophet. In other words, go back and do what prophets do. Go back and do what prophets do. Elijah, you're a prophet. You're a prophet. Go back and do what prophets do. If you're a mom, if you're a mom and you're struggling, just go back and do what moms do. Love your kid. Lead them in the ways of the Lord. Keep doing what you're supposed to do. Finding rest, replacing lies, listening for God, and just doing what you're supposed to do. In Elijah's case, he's a prophet, which is a gift. And some of you are gifted. Some of you are servants. You have the gift of serving if your gift is serving, you want to get out of the hole, go back and serve. Some of you are givers. If your gift is giving, go give to somebody. 
Some of you are encouragers and you're in a hole. Get back in your calling and go encourage somebody. Some of you have the gift of administration. Well, go back and make a list. Whatever. Go back and use your gift. Keep on walking in what the Lord is gifting you to do to fulfill His purpose. And He will bring you through. So I want to look at this. God gave him this friend. He goes back and anoints, anoints Elisha. <laughs> and um, we're going to have some fun in the next four weeks as we begin looking at Elisha. Okay, we're going to have some fun looking at him. There's some cool stories dealing with Elisha. Elijah goes back and he anoints Elisha. Okay, and Elisha actually says to Elijah, I know it's like it's like we're doing riddles up here. Elijah says to Elisha says to Elijah, he says, listen, when you die, just leave me a double portion of what you got, because I want to be able to rock and roll like you do. I want to be able to glorify the Lord the way you do. So just leave me a double portion. And Elijah's and Elijah's like, all right, if you just do what you're supposed to do, then I'll do that. So so I want to go back. I want to go back to the beginning of the story. Elisha, one day, he has this one friend. Instead of shutting people out, now he has this one friend. Elijah has Elisha. And they're walking alone, okay? He's done the things God has called him to do. He, he's ate, he's gotten rest. He's replaced the lies, okay? He, is, he has gone back out doing what he's supposed to do, and he's walking along with Elisha. And it says, now, now remember, what was his greatest fear? What was his greatest fear? He'd done all these things, but when the woman said, you will die, what was it he was afraid of? Death. He was afraid of death. This is so cool what's about to happen. The thing that Elijah feared the most, death. Watch as he's walking along with his friend. As he's walking along, it says they're walking along and they're talking together. And suddenly a chariot of fire and horses of fire appeared and separated the two of them. And Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind. What? He goes up to heaven in a whirlwind. And Elisha saw this and he cries out, My father, my father, the chariots and the horsemen of Israel. And Elisha saw him no more. The reality is, for some of you, the thing that you fear the most, the thing that you is consuming you, you'll never even experience. You'll never even experience the thing that you fear the most, the thing that is driving you into the pit. Some of you will never even experience that thing that you're afraid of. Now, I wish that I was a feel-good preacher that blinked a lot and tell you that's the end of it right there, but I'm not. I wish I could tell you that all of you will never experience the thing that you'll fear the most, but I can't. Jesus said in this world, we will have many troubles. Some of us are going to face some troubles. Others, we're just living in fear of something that's never even going to happen in our lives. Others are going to face troubles. I'm not saying that they won't, that we won't. But here's the thing. Even when we face troubles... Even when we face troubles, He will be with you. He will. When you're facing trouble, He will be with you. And if you will, if you will eat and rest, if you'll eat and rest, if you'll replace Satan's lies, if you'll just do what you're supposed to do, He will be enough. He will be enough. We've got to. To lean on Him. And the way to do what we're supposed to do is what? We gotta, we gotta listen. He's speaking to you today. I know He's speaking to you. He's telling you something. I don't know what He's telling you. He may be telling you one thing and He may be telling you another, but He's speaking to you today. Whatever He's telling you, listen. And go back and do what you're supposed to do. You know, this is really comforting to me. Because Elijah, he, he goes through these spiritual highs and he hits emotional lows. Pretty cool. This is a really profound reminder of what we read last week, that Elijah was a man just like us. Just like us. It's so good to know that God uses people that can be on top of the world serving Him one moment and the next minute ready to die. Because I know, I know from my own life and from the testimonies you've shared with me, 
we are men and women just like Elijah, just like him. We can go through this, and it's good to know. It's good to know that he is a man just like us, and it's also good to know that in the end, the Lord still showed up and prevailed. We can trust that. The Lord will show up and prevail. If I can get you to bow your heads and close your eyes, I know some of you are facing depression. I know some of you are hurting. I know some of you are wearing yourself out. Some of you are feeling alone. Some of you are are just in despair. You're just about ready to say, Lord, just take me now. I'm so tired. I don't want to do this anymore. If that's you today, if today you know you need Him, let me see your hand. See your hand. Let us let us pray together. Let's pray together. Father, we come before you right now, Lord, and I I just want to lift up the church to you today. Not just those that raise their hands but also those that were afraid to raise their hands. And Lord, for those that had no need, we're in a place right now where we're walking with you, trusting you. Pray that we will stand together praying for those who are crying out right now. Lord, for those that have been just wearing themselves ragged, getting tired, fighting spiritual battles, physically exhausted, mentally exhausted, mentally exhausted, emotionally exhausted. Lord, I pray right now that you will impress upon their hearts and give them the strength to obey your command and rest in you. Lord, for those that are that are focusing on the negative, Lord, I pray right now that they will replace the lies with your Lord, I do pray that as you speak to us, that we will listen. That we will listen, Lord. And that we will go back and do what you've called us to do. Lord, lift us up out of this pit. Bring us out of this desert of despair. Lord, bring us back to a place where we can walk in our purpose. Give us the strength daily to chase after you and to do your will, to glorify your name, to love you with all of our hearts, all of our souls, and all of our minds, and Lord, to love others just as we love ourselves. Father, I pray right now, peace and strength in overcoming these disparaging situations. Lord, lift us up. In Jesus' name. Amen. Now, this message is so powerful because depression. I mean, it is serious. But Elijah did. He got back up and did what he was supposed to do. And if you've been hurting, know that if you will return to your first love, his purpose in your life will prevail. You may not even face the thing not even face the thing that you're driving you down. You just may not. But if you do, I pray you'll be enough. And I pray that if you do face the things you're afraid of, I pray if you are depressed, that you will not shut people out. But you know that you are in a church full of people that want to love you, that want to stand with you, that want to encourage you want to fellowship with you, that want to build you up, that want to serve alongside you. You are in a place of healing. This is our Mount Horeb. This is our place to experience God together when we come together like this. Let it not just be on Sundays. Not just on Sundays. Let's be a family. Let's stand together and experience His goodness together. Help
What I want to do right now, um, because I always experience His goodness um, in this way, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time teaching on it today. I'm going to call the ushers forward, and we're going to take up the offering today. We're just going to give back to a good God what He's commanded us to give. And we're going to trust Him to bless it because He always does. If you're a tither today, you know that. If you give, you know how good He is. And today, I'm just going to pray over what He gives. That He will continue using it. That we will be good stewards of it. And that we will be able to continue reaching people that are maybe lost in that desert that need to know His love. So let's pray. Father, we thank you right now for your goodness. We thank you for everything you've provided to us, everything you've given us. And Lord, right now, as we just return what's yours, it's not even ours, it's yours, and as we give it back to you, Lord, I pray that you will build us up in our faith as we see how good you are and that you do fulfill your promises. May we may we use these experiences as you fulfill your promises, you're faithful in our giving. May we use this to build us up in very, very challenging situations. When evil queens threaten us with our lives, may we use your faithfulness through our giving. May we, may we use that to see that you are so good that you will show up, that your purpose will prevail. Thank you for what we give today. We pray you use it to reach people in this city. In Jesus' name, amen. As they're passing this, I want to tell everybody, um, in February, okay, in February, it's going to be February 11th and 12th. That's um, that's a Thursday and a Friday. We're going to leave out on a Wednesday night. Wednesday the 10th, we're going to leave out. And um, or Tuesday the 10th, we're going to leave out. On Tuesday the 10th, we're going to leave out. And we're going to go to Dallas, uh, to a conference in Dallas called C3 Conference, Creative Church Culture Conference. And um, anyone that wants to go, um, we can we have free tickets available to go for anyone that wants to go. So if you're interested in making that trip with us, um, let me know. Um, we need to know, though, by the end of today, really, because I've got to let them know who is going. So um, if you're interested in going, let me know so that I can let them know who all is going. Um, you can put it on your connection card. Go to the connection table and see Jackie. Jackie, raise your hand. Jody, raise your hand as well. Go see one of them if you're interested in going. Don't try to come tell me because I will forget. Let them know and they'll let me know on paper, okay? <laughs> Kelly's like, he will. He'll forget. Um, <laughs> let, let them know so we can get it down. Anyone that wants to go, we'd love for you to go. It's going to be an incredible, incredible time. Um, a time where we can eat of the Lord and we can just grow. We can be refreshed and renewed in Him and learn some really cool things um, and ways that we can effectively serve and make a difference um, better. I feel like being attacked or knocking me off my game. Well, I'm fixing to run. Afraid for my life going to run. now I just I, in fact I, I told someone last night um, Beth's not is Beth here this is Beth's not here right now she's here later probably I told Beth last night I love what I do it's a privilege it is a privilege to be able to serve you to, to get to know you all to build relationships with you I am so blessed by you guys and I love you all and I, I pray for you all constantly Thank y'all for allowing me to walk in my calling, to serve you and to build you up in the faith, equipping you 
to go out and fulfill the commission, to go out and make Jesus known in this world, develop sold out models. I get to do this. So thank you all.